Hello, everyone. Welcome to another screening series Q&A. My name is Armando Samudio, and I am the Public Programs and Events Coordinator here at IDA. For our blind and low vision attendees, I'm going to identify myself. I have a green sweater, messy hair, light skin, and a white backdrop. I wanna start by thanking our media sponsors, Variety and KCRW for sponsoring our 2022 screening series. This evening, we'll have a conversation between film journalist, Matt Carey, and director Shlomi Alkovitz, whose film Black Notebooks, Run It, world premiered at the Lemley. For more information or to see more amazing films like this, please visit www.documentary.org forward slash screening dash series. To help us grow by donating and or interested in joining IDA's global network of documentary professionals, please visit documentary.org forward slash membership. Now, before we get started, I would like to offer a brief land acknowledgement. We recognize the Gabrielino, Tongva, and Chumash as the past, present, and future caretakers of the land, water, and cultural resources in the unceded territory of Los Angeles. Thank you so much, Andrea Lust, for ASL interpreting this discussion. And with that, I pass it to Matt. Thank you. Hi, I am Matt Carey, documentary editor at Deadline. And for our blind and low vision viewers, I am sitting in front of a red wall background, wearing a blue pork pie hat, I've got dark glasses, pink polka dot, well, actually blue polka dot shirt. And I am a white male. And with that, it's my privilege to welcome to this conversation, the director of the film, Shlomi Elkabetz. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi, Matt. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Shlomi Elkabetz, uh, the director of the film. I'm wearing a white shirt. Unfortunately, no hair. I'm from a Moroccan uh, descent. Uh, I have a beard, which is a little white and uh, a little black, you know, uh, and I'm happy to be here with you. Thanks. So Shlomi, this is such a, of course, personal, deeply touching film. You, you shot footage of your sister and I'm sure other things for many, many years. At what point did you begin to think that perhaps it could be turned into a, a documentary? Uh, I shot over the years. I shot. Uh, I'm shooting because I, uh, you know, I'm shooting my fiction films, and like over the year, I, I have cameras which I use. And usually, when I'm shooting, I, I shoot because I feel I create another layer of time. It's just another layer of time. It's like not even memories. Or usually, the things I shoot are very banal. I would shoot uh, my sister go up the stairs. I have like sixty shots like that. I, I have her coming with a cab home maybe a hundred times. Um, so there was never really an intention to make a real film out of it, but yes, to document, to document, to document. And I, and I archived throughout the years. Um, in 2017, I thought I wanted to, to maybe look at my archives and see if there's a possibility to create a film. I did not have um, uh, an idea of what kind of film it's going to be, but uh, I did want to try to do something. And I, and I actually edited something uh, that was very nice. Um, I showed it to some people, and everyone like liked it in a way. It was like um, it was like a chronic, uh, a chronic uh, uh, events. Uh, there's not too much talking in my film. Um, it was nice, but I, I thought I asked myself many times, why should I? I mean, why do I do it actually? Like you know, I mean, why why should I show this like a chronicle? And um, but I I really wanted to to do something with it. And at a certain point uh, of the editing, uh, I said, all right, that's not gonna be my film. It's okay, I waste, I, I spent like a few months in the editing room, nothing happened. I'm just gonna move on to my next film. And then I had this idea and the idea was interesting for me. What I thought is why I was, I was asking myself, why do I treat my archives as the past of my character and myself? I mean, wh why should I treat it like that? I would, let me try to treat it as the present. I will just treat the, the archives as the present. And if my archives are the present, it means that I'm coming from the future because 
I know what's going to happen to my characters. And at that point, something really interesting happened because uh, the minute I went into this present, knowing what's going to happen, I had the chance to maybe change the upcoming events of our lives, which is like the death of my sister. And in that, in that row of, of actions, uh, I had this documentary film, which is dealing with time, because at that moment, every, every shot of my film, which was like really banal, like Ronit coming up the stairs, getting out of a taxi, getting home, uh, became um, a matter of uh, a battle, a conflict between men and time, because at that moment, time was hunting us. And me entering the story into the screen as a character, as well, a small character in the film, but as a character uh, signifying the, the future of the characters. And maybe with my knowledge, I can change it. Maybe in this journey with cinema, I can change it. And then I had this, another idea, which was, I want to write on it a new role in a film. It's a role that usually uh, is kept for men. It's like men against time, death, nature. And I will write a role for this woman, for my sister, for this actress. And the role is woman against time, nature, and death. And, um, and you know, Ronit was not there. Uh, so I said, I will, I will ask one of my characters in my films, in Get, I will ask my character, Vivian Amsalem, who is a character in my film, to play Ronit in my new film. And using the footage and and the things that I, and the things I shot on the set while shooting get, cleaning out completely the narrative of the film get. What I had is like instead of Ronit asking for her freedom from the from the court, I had a woman asking for life. I just used the same actions, and then I had Vivian Amsalem playing Ronit. I had my shots together, and I started to tell this um, this uh, this diary this chronicle from different point of views of times and it became really fascinating because it was it became a chase the film became like a documentary that is a chase between woman and time um at that point it also uh, became very emotional and dramatic and but when you really look at the film if you dismay if, if you dismantle it from this idea and you just look at the shots it's like it's very interesting yeah it's like but it's really direct simple uh simple shots on top of that of course i had this uh, magnificent um, ability of one it to talk to the camera whether you shoot her in fiction or you shoot her in documentary she always had an intention and this intention can be converted to anything if you find the right contest and this was the process of making that yeah yeah oh, it's, it's so extraordinarily layered and it's interesting as you talk about the scenes that you were shooting in the film before the court. Yeah, as you're describing it now, it does become a, almost a woman pleading for her life. Right. These implacable judges who were like, no, it is it is written in effect. And right. Then, and from, from your vantage point as the filmmaker, you know that fate could not be changed and yet through this exercise of the film, in a sense, you you are changing it, or within the uh, the sphere of the film itself. So it's a, it's sure a that, uh, I, mean, I, I know when the film is going to end, and always like you know a few minutes before the film ends, because I know it's going to end, and I know that there's going to be this point where I meet myself in this in the film, and and the minute I meet myself in the film at the end of the film. I know that fate cannot be changed, but I do believe every time I see the film that it's possible to change it. And we see during the the, the filming of Get that your sister was was uh, getting you know distressed because she couldn't complete full takes, or you know, she she just wasn't satisfied with her ability to concentrate or focus in some way. D did you all know that she was ill at that point, or was it only? apparent afterwards 
no, not at all. You know, the, the, the regular state of when we shoot a film, we are we are, we are dead. We are tired. We it's hard to concentrate. You know, before we even start to shoot, we had like you know one year before us before that we were like you know working every day. So when you eventually come to the set, you're so tired. So nothing looks uh, unusual in coming every morning to the set and be, being tired and trying to find your concentration. So on that on, on that uh, thing, it was like uh, no, it was just regular shooting. You're tired, then you're overcoming your tiredness, and every day, you know, you do what you need to do, and you move on. So nothing seemed unusual, not at all. In that sense, it was the natural place of the both of us in the shoot. Mm. I mean, looking back, of course, uh, it was there, but um, not. You know, if I knew, uh, if I knew that that this is what's going on, I would never shoot. I would never shoot this film. You know. Mm. If, do it i would never shoot it you know because i don't shoot drama i do not I, I don't you know if something dramatic happens i take my camera down mm. i mean i do the fiction films you know i shoot my drama in the fiction films so when i'm documenting i'm really trying to capture another layer of time that's it and as you were alluding to i mean your sister was so compelling you know whether you were asking her you know maybe her grocery list of the day or something and it also struck me there's a scene towards the end where you're shooting up at her and she's on like the balcony of the paris apartment and i thought she could have been a, fi a silent film star she could hold the screen in that way so even if you were shooting the mundane there was something about her reaching through the camera and and seizing the viewer. I mean, that that's such a remarkable quality and one can't define where it comes from. But uh, right. did it surprise you as, as her brother when she got into acting and suddenly it was so apparent that she belonged on the screen? Uh, I was very young when it happened. I was like, uh, I was like 13 or 14. And um, yeah, at that time in Israel, it was really not common to make cinema. Even when Ronit and I decided that we we're going to make our first film, we didn't really believe that we we're going to make a film. We wrote a script and like, so when Ronit came into this world, uh, uh, it was not surprising. It was just like, um, it was a natural thing. What was surprising is that cinema exists at all and that she found her way to, to, this, uh, to this art in that sense. Uh, but the minute she was on the screen, uh, it was uh, it was inevitable. Inevitable. You had to look at her. You had to look at her because she she had this remarkable relationship with the camera. Her ability to play out her thoughts without doing nothing, just being there, was uh, was truly um, remarkable. Uh, I can say that as a director, it was to prepare the shoot, and then. Uh, into the frame and it became cinema you know in that in that sense uh, and and you know for this scene at the end where, where I discover on it um, um, yeah you know we are we are on the screen we are phantoms on the screen we are phantoms and uh, and on the screen this scene is possible even though at that moment at that point we know when it is not is no longer in this apartment and we know she's not there and and um uh, but in cinema, it's possible. Mm -hmm. As a phantom, she can live in cinema, as we all do. Right, exactly. Yeah. You make a, a critical choice with the music. The music is absolutely, you know, just central to, I think, your artistic vision here. And I, I was so struck by it. I think, I think that's Bernard Herrmann. Right. Or in the beginning... And of course, that's Im immediately evoking Hitchcock and giving so much tension and, and suspense to it. Um, tell me about uh, choosing that for for the, you know, later we hear the Mahler's Fifth Symphony as well, but but particularly right. Bernard Herrmann using that music and what the drama and suspense that that added to the to the film. The, the the thing was, in the, I mean, there were a few things that were like uh, connecting. Uh, one was like, you know, this man who's obsessed with this woman who's trying to give her body and, and like, you know, trying to make her make her live 
with the external um, ads. And uh, that was like, you know, one thing. Death uh, the More, the book that Vertigo was based on, is like also was part of it, but more of everything. The minute I, the minute I understood that my film is about time and there's like a chase. And it's like a suspense film in the sense that you're really, even if you know that Ronit is going to die, you still hope that she will not and that cinema will give her what I want for her. Uh, the whole Herman uh, theme uh, was just perfect in so many ways. Not only it add uh, a, a, an amazing suspenseful dimension to the movie, but what, what happened when I placed Bern, uh, the, the Bernard Herrmann's uh, uh, themes on the film is like, first thing that happened that every little scene that was just like very, very simple became cinema. In that sense, like with the Bernard Herrmann music, I, I could declare that this is a film. It's a documentary film, right? Everything you see is real. It's really hair going up the stairs. Nothing was written. It's like pure documentation, but it is a film. It is a film. It's not like, you know, I, I wanted to live for a second from, I didn't want like, all right, documentary cinema, cinema gives you some kind of a reality. Like uh, for most people, you know, when they watch documentary, they, you know, they, they, they think, all right, I'm seeing what is happening. But we know as filmmakers that any cinema, the minute we shot, the minute we place it in a context, the minute we combine it in a, in a story that accumulates to what we're aiming for, it's a film and it and it has no difference from any other film. And the uh, Herman music was just perfect to declare that every time. And of course the Herman music, uh, since there's not too much talking in my film, except for a couple of times that we were talking, um, gave, uh, gave uh, an exceptional uh, opportunity uh, for me to follow Nitz Scott's as she go through the process of trying to defy uh, faith. In that sense, uh, it helped me a lot. Mm. And, and for Mahler's Fet, I immediately thought of Lucchino Visconti's Death in Venice. Right. So central to that film. And, and so it plays on that level, you know, for those who, who catch that reference, but also it, it leads to this remarkable scene of your sister kind of riffing and creating an entire film on the basis of hearing the music, which is right. a startling act of creativity. Right. Yeah, it's true. It's like, um, it's, uh, it, ha it, it actually has to do with what we just spoke about, uh, the, the, the Bernard the Herman's music uh, and what he does for the film. Uh, I think the sublimation uh, that uh, Onit is doing in that in that moment, like uh, actually, it's actually listening to the image rather than seeing the image. So, and 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 I, you know, I had many many scenes. I have over seven hundred hours, and when I some of the scenes I, I remember that I had some I discovered and when I discovered that moment I did not remember that I shot it I just saw it and I said wow I mean this is the film this is exactly black notebooks you're not looking at it you're listening to it it's a film that you listen to and watching it is like and watching it is like uh, an extra thing in that sense you could really listen to black notebooks you could really listen to it, and and I think, I think if you listen to it, you, you will, you will feel the same things. You will feel the same things, and uh, that's what Ronit is doing at that at that moment. She's listening to the film that could have been written with that music, with that moment, but also, in a very beautiful way, she describes her own life. You know, like if we go to our own history. We come from this small town and like, you know, and we did away and we come back and we go back and forth. Basically, the whole idea of immigration, immigration of ideas, our own immigration from Morocco to Israel, then to Paris, then back to this whole journey, you know, and what it requires from us is all embodied in this like uh, beautiful few minutes um, 
when Ronit is listening to the music and she sees another film. Mm. But basically, it's her film. Mm. It's That's, her story. It's a fascinating moment that you let play out and is so rich in that sense. You're the youngest brother. You've got two other brothers. Uh, how is Ronit as an older sister? Um... Uh, you know, we, we our house. My father, uh, my father call, calls our house the the central bank, which means like the door. There's vaults, there's vaults, and everyone is in his room. Nobody's coming out, and like we never let our parents get into our rooms. And like, uh, but we had like you know, so we never disturbed each other as as you know at home. Each one had his own like you know space, but we did have this like you know uh, small meetings. The meetings would be like, you know, in the corridor, in the shower, you know, we never ate dinner at home at the same time, but we were there, you know, we were there and like, um, and it was very, very quiet, but, um, but we always saw each other and Ronit is, is an older sister, I felt as, as a 10 year old younger uh, brother that uh, she always saw me, she saw me and I saw her too, and it was really, it was pleasant. It was pleasant to know that somebody is seeing you. Uh, in that sense, um, our our dialogue that, like, few years later, you know, ten years later, after she left home, uh, what whatever started between us later, actually started long time before without talking. And uh, she was an amazing sister in so many ways. Uh, we had a very uh, very um, complex relationships. Uh, but we were very similar in so many ways. And, you know, for, for Onit and myself, we had this huge gift because we created together. So, yes, we could have been like good brother and sister, but thanks to art and cinema, we became, at a certain point, like uh, one soul, you know, not always, but when we went into the process of, of, of creating, it was... Uh, it was quite amazing in that sense. Well, you know, cool. beside that, we had like crazy. I mean, if you if you saw the trilogy, it's not autobiographical, but it but but you could see what our home looked like. You know, it was like uh, it was a crazy. Uh, you know, my parents like uh, you know it was it was a jungle, but for but with us it was always like very calm. Between them, it was like, uh, and we were there. We were like, you know, in this jungle and we always felt safe in a very weird way. We felt safe. So we were there for each other. And she was like, the, she was one woman. We were three men, three brothers, one sister, the older one. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's, you made three films together, as, as you mentioned, and, and we see so much of Get or Le Posse in the, uh, here and and this film, this documentary is your 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 latest collaboration together, I think, and it's right. deep, moving and a, a powerful film. It is Black Notebooks, Ronit, and we've been speaking with the director Shlomi Elkabetz. It's been a great pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea.